Mike. Steve. You know, while we're writing season two of The Last Resort, what we should really do with our time is we could discuss the characters' favourite movies. I- interesting concept, Steve, because I like movies, and, well, you like movies, and um, our characters like movies too. Then it's settled. The Last Resort Movie Club is born. Hello and welcome to another episode of Bad Scripts Last Resort Movie Club. And today joining me, surprisingly, is Mr. Mike Garlia. Hi, Mike. Hi. Why is that a surprise? No, it was a sarcastic surprise because it's always you that joins is it? me. Well, so. I, well I, I intend to stay for the whole episode this time and not disappear wow. like I did on uh, the, got the uh, podcast father's uh, on the indie podcaster, yeah, we were guests on that show, and uh, yeah, Mike disappeared part way through. Um, I think, and I've gone. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was the infamous line, and I'm gone. But we can still see you. You weren't aware of this, so um, it was it was quite amusing, and and probably a lesson that always plug in your laptop when you're talking to people in other countries. I think, is and probably... wear trousers, and wear trousers when you stand up, and yeah, that's, um, that's you're not you're not wearing trousers or underwear. I, anyway, I am just. Getting oh, into the flavour of the episode, that's all. That That's fine, and you just give me plenty to edit. That's that's good. It's all good. So um, we've got yet another episode has landed on our doorsteps, uh, and it's time for us to talk again about another movie from the bygone era. Um, and today's uh, episode, um, would you care to tell us who our character is and, and uh, perhaps give us your... Your weekly synopsis on uh, on our movie, of course. So this uh, week is our wonderful character Robin's choice, and and as we know, um, Robin is a dancer, he's a singer, he's a performer. So I think when we reveal this week's episode, it's all going to make sense. So I'll give the synopsis first, Steve, and then and it gives people a chance to try and guess. Uh, what film we're going to cover before I read the uh, before I reveal the title? So this film came out in June of 1982. It scored an average rating of just 3.6 um, on Rotten Tomatoes. It is a sequel to a very successful film, and to give you a bit of background on that, the first film was made for six million and made 400 million dollars worldwide. This film was made for 12 million and accrued 15 million dollars worldwide. So um, was it a flop? Maybe it's had cult status since. And here is the synopsis. It's 1961, two years after the original gang graduated. And there's a new crop of seniors and new members of the coolest cliques on campus, the Pink Ladies and T-Birds. Michael Carrington is the new kid in school but he's been branded a brainiac. Can he fix up an old motorcycle, don a leather jacket, avoid a rumble with the leader of the T-Birds and win the heart of pink lady Stephanie? Steve, what is the film? The film that you're referring to is none other than Grease 2. A sequel no one asked for. No, that's not the uh, subtitle. It's just the way we feel about this movie. Um, I suppose we should really hear from Robin um, and what his thoughts were on this movie before we start to talk about our thoughts on this film. Um, if you're happy to do that, Matt, we can, we can go over and see what Robin's up to. Let's hear from Robin. Great. Sort of 
before I felt like I could be who I am. Uh, so that's really where I, uh, I, I, I think I found an affinity with this this movie. And yeah, I guess you know that that's it. And there's songs and there's dancing and there's reproduction, which obviously I'm not a big expert on, but um, it's just a lot of fun. And that's why Grease Two is my fave movie. Thank so, you, Robin. Yeah, that was Robin and uh, Robin's take on Grease Two. Uh, Mike, you've watched this film. I've watched this film. What was your, you know, I mean, we probably, did you watch this as a kid? So, yes, and, and once. Now, I was a, obviously a bit of a fan of the original Grease, and I, yeah. as a kid, felt that, um, well, I didn't like it as a kid. I didn't like it, and I've not watched it since I was probably about 10, uh, maybe a bit younger than that. And until now, so, um, and I want to put it in context as well before we start right with Grease 2, because I, you know I always throw a, a few little things. So Grease 2 came out in 1982, and I want to give you the movie list of 1982. It came out in the same week as E.T. Wow. And, and as we know, E.T. was this behemoth um, film, but other films that came out, and this will give you a flavor of, of this, this year, other films that came out was Rocky Three. Uh, which we know was the cheesiest and campest of all Rocky films. Um, you can't beat Apollo Creed and uh, and Rocky running on the beach in crop tops and, and no. tight shorts, high fiving each other. And did you know that Rocky Three actually made more money than the original Rocky movie? It was I the most successful it. film at the time until Four came out. And that, and until that was, Four came out, that yeah. was massive. Yeah, Rocky but... Four was the pinnacle, yeah. wasn't it? It was. The, it was one, one of yeah. those things where all the sequels kind of uh, were out sh- outshining the originals, and yeah. But we digress. But that was just something that came to mind when you said that. No, just, I love it. I love it. You know, that Keep week, it going. This is you know yeah. that. But that shows what kind of movies were coming out that year. What kind of box office fodder there was. And well, this it was, was a mixed chance. choice. It was a mix. It was a mixture. It was a mixture. So we had Rocky Three. We had undoubtedly the scariest film of my childhood, um, the one that absolutely scared the bejesus out of me. And any guesses what that one was? Was it a Nightmare on Elm Street film? It wasn't Nightmare on Elm Street. Right. Um, I'll try and I'll, I'll try and do the theme tune. It was. It was again produced by Steven Spielberg. And it was. La 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 la. Uh, basically, a girl getting sucked into a TV. Poltergeist. Poltergeist. Scare the living daylights out of me when I was a kid. Um, probably too young to watch it. Yeah. Um, the Beastmaster. Do you remember that one? Oh, I do remember that one. Yes. The guy who could it. talk to ferrets. Um... <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll stop that there. We'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll end that. But but also, Greece too. You know, tip to make it stars, absolute household names. This movie was the, you know, this was this was going to be the biggest thing since the original. Just a few years before, this was going to be a continuation uh, and make you know stellar stars of these people. And I'd like to say Michelle Pfeiffer is a massive worldwide star, in spite of this movie. <laughs> so. What were your, so, I mean, I know you didn't like it as a kid. Actually, I did. And I, I, I think it was the whole kind of, there was an English guy in it, which kind of make, give me an affinity. He, he was a bit geeky. So I kind of felt for him a little. And then he liked riding motorbikes. So I think that was kind of, well, he did eventually, but that kind of sang to me. And I want, you know, I, I thought as a kid, wow, this is a great movie. Um, and then we watched it this week, and maybe my mind has been changed somewhat. So I get the Michelle Pfeiffer coming out good in this film, right? Because if you think about her character and you think about what she represents as a character, actually, for the time, it was, it was quite... And, and I want to get under the skin of that, because at the time, it was... She wasn't the damsel in distress. She wasn't, oh, sorry, the damsel in distress. She <laughs> wasn't, um, she wasn't the one. So she basically says throughout the whole film and she keeps this going, I don't care who you are. I'm no one's trophy. I'm no one's girlfriend. I can kiss who I want. 
And and that kind of has led to cult status of Greece too, that she's one of the first female characters to empower kind of female independence and, and choice and stuff like that. And in comparison, Johnny, who the leader, who's the leader of the T-Bird, is an absolute dick. <laughs> he, he's a prize wally, isn't he? His hair's too big. He's too short. <laughs> he's got There's, big hair. He just, yeah. And and he doesn't, you know, when you, when you compare, I mean, when you think of Travolta as Danny, Johnny is like the runt of the litter. He's like this this thing that is supposed to sort of represent what Danny was a little, but I can't explain Let, it. Let's not forget, this is two years after Greece 1 is set, right? So it's yeah. like, and, and these guys are in their final year. So these guys would have been at school with with Sandy and Danny and the pink ladies and the T-Birds and they're, they're passed on the mantle. So there's the, yeah. whoever took it on before that has obviously gone as well. And then yeah. these guys have taken over. So by that logic, when you become a senior, that's when you get incorporated into these two gangs. Yeah. Um, do, do you know what really annoyed me throughout the film? Consistently annoyed me. Yeah. Go on. All the hair grabbing and the collar grabbing. That's all any character seemed to do was either touch their hair and, and Johnny was the worst one or pull their collars constantly. And it was, if you count how many times he did it, it was every, it was like the character thing that they all had to do, um, which really, cause I couldn't see past it every time yeah. they came on. I was just looking for it. Yeah. And, and, and as has been a recurring theme in a lot of the movies we've looked at during this period, very sexually aggressive again, extremely aggressive. And like you said, it was great that we had, a strong feminine character this time around who wasn't going to take that, but there was still a lot of sexual aggression and um, very uh, on PC behavior by a lot of the members of the cast, you know, and, and it, 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 you'd kind of feel like, yes, I know when this was set and it, do you know what? This had more of an air of Porky's to it, the film we talked about before, <laughs> than it did of Grease. And I don't know if you felt that too. There was a seedy undertone to it. There was it, every song was so full of innuendo. There was there was no innocence. You know, in Greece we had Sandra D. We had that innocence and the and the compromise between to, for those two worlds to come together. This was just CD on top of CD on top of CD, and there was no let up. There was a wink and a nod in the first film. So like one of the lyrics in, in one of the songs in the first film was she was good, if you know what I mean. You know, yeah. that's open to interpretation. There's no interpretation in this one. <laughs> Not I needed. Mean, uh, and we'll come on to it, but there's a whole scene where one of the T-Birds gets the virgin pink lady into a bomb shelter, into a, a nuclear fallout shelter, and then basically says, it's your patriotic duty to lose your virginity to me tonight. While the guys are outside, like with a klaxon, you know, yeah, and <laughs> letting off the, the nuclear air raid siren, letting <laughs> her think it could be the end of the world. So I better shag him because we need to repopulate the earth. Now, that seems a little desperate to me in order to get laid. But hey, who am I to judge? But hey, listen, Steve, there is a theme appearing in our podcasts mm-hmm. in terms of the films that we have, um, that we are covering, that our characters have chosen, that there is a link to them all. Um, but did you know this? Did you know that they thought they were that co- they were that convinced this was going to be a major, 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 major uh, hit that they had another three sequels and a spin-off TV show planned? To- did you know that? Wow, I did not know that, and that is extremely scary. <laughs> it really is. Uh, so, are we going to cover some of the recurring characters? Some of the returning characters? So there there from- are some. That that was something that got me. Was that there are definitely some characters that we saw in the first movie that return. And then one that at least inexplicably, inexplicably disappears about halfway through. Um, Frenchie. Frenchie. She comes in. She says, oh, I'm back at school because I went. I was a beauty school dropout, as the song was. But I'm back now because I want to do my own cosmetics line. So I need to study chemistry. So I'm back at high school. OK, fair enough. It's a familiar face. We feel comfortable around Frenchie. She's a nice girl. There's no real relevance to the plot, but she's a familiar face, so they stuck her in there, yeah? She just turns up to move the story along, and the only person she interacts with is Michael. I have a theory. I don't think she's real. I don't think she exists. No one talk, like no one really talks to her, and no one really acknowledges her. She doesn't have any dialogue with anyone other 
than Michael. That's a really good observation because she's wearing a pink lady outfit, uh, the jacket, but she doesn't speak to any of the other pink ladies None. and is never and referred they don't, to. They, they barely acknowledge her as well. And the only time she's ever with them is, is, is kind of a group scene where they just laugh and walk off. But you don't know whether... I don't think she's there. I think she's, you know, she's like... Do you think, uh, think maybe she was killed in a car crash, a motorcycle crash, and she's like a, um, a spirit that's his, like, guide through one better i think the flying car at the end of greece uh, didn't fly that far and when um when sandy turns and waves at everyone it loses power and it just lands on them all and splats them all and frenchie just can't accept it and come back oh wow that's dark <laughs> that's <laughs> very deep. anyway um so i i do know why so basically she was told halfway through production um we don't need you anymore don't come back um but thanks very much wow. um and that that was her that was her done that is that is crazy. And but they also brought back the bully, I noticed Crater Face, and I forgot his name escapes me at the moment, the character, but um he was like the protagonist car racing guy who races against Kinniki, but then Danny ends up racing against him in the first one. And he's driving cars at that point. Now, in my mind, you start with motorbikes and progress to cars. That didn't happen. This it seems it seems like They've gone, we need a theme here. We did the racing cars before. Let's do motorbikes this time. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason why suddenly nobody drives a car anymore and everybody's on motorbikes. Other than the, pink the ladies drive a pink car. They, they do, a bashed up old pink car. Yeah, it's, it's bizarre, isn't it? It's... But the, the, there's no reason why Craterface needs to be in the film. He inexplicably turns up three times, just three times in the film at certain points and disappears as quickly as he arrives. He's not, I mean, they're obviously a little bit threatening, but the, they, they never explore the rivalry between the two. Like, why is he terrorized? Why does he keep turning up at this school? He is a middle-aged man with a <laughs> biker gang. Be, why does he? he keep coming to the school? Exactly. And and now, this is something that really bugged me in this movie, right? If you remember, the T-Birds were real rivals with them, okay? In the original movie, right? In this movie, these are kids that are younger than, than them, two years younger than them, okay? They are, look terrified of this gang, the T-Birds do, and they wimp out of any kind of interaction with them unless there's one of them on their own. It's not a rivalry. To me, it feels like some sort of wrong child abuse kind of scenario. <laughs> what? Why are you picking oh. on these kids? I mean, what's it's just, going on? But it doesn't explain why they keep reason. turning up. It doesn't, yeah. like, they just, he just keeps turning up and, yeah, he's like, you know, but if in the original film, he was after the girl. He was after um, uh, Rizzo, and yeah. and that's where some of that rival re- came the, from. Yeah, and the and the car racing. You wanted to get the win the other one's car, and all. And again, that you know, <clears throat> all the T birds have changed. Could could they have not just had somebody different as a rival from motorcycle gang? Why did they have to use the same character and the same actor? Was it just to keep it? In, yeah, to keep it in the same universe, so it felt like. There was, you know, this wasn't just a cheap imitation of the original, which I'm sorry, but that's very much what it feels like it is. Well, and, they did bring back some of the faculty as well from the original yeah. films. They brought back the, the headmistress, yeah, and Sid Caesar, uh, the classic yeah. Sid Caesar. As I mean, the you can't fault Sid coach. Caesar for what he does. He does what he does, and that's that's great. And the and the secretary from the school as well. She was back too, wasn't she? Ap- but felt- apart from the fact that the the Sid Caesar character at the very beginning throws a basketball into the face of a student full whack. He does not hold back. And if you watch it really carefully, he looks right at the camera with his bemused look in his face. He threw a basketball in, in, in square into someone's head. <laughs> well, to be fair, that, that did happen at my school in the 90s. So um, it's, not, <laughs> it's not unheard of. In the 60s, I imagine that was just part of the lesson. You know, so um, I think that's fair. I think that's fair play. Um, Anyone's game. Well, fun fact for you, Steve. Fun fact. Go for uh, it. All the motorcycles they're driving didn't come out until 1966. Oh, wow. So that was uh, somebody uh, Somebody wasn't paying attention to, uh, uh, you know, the, the continuity and, and, and his homework. <laughs> I, I was that intrigued by, by the nostalgia. And I know we'll come on to the songs as well because the songs are not in keeping with the period either. Nope. Nor is the hairstyles 
for something like Michelle's five her hairstyle is not in keeping with 1961 at all. No, she seems really out of place. She's like a time traveler. She's wearing mm. like 80s sweatshirts and stuff. Um, she's really dowdy, really, in the movie compared to everyone else. And it's not kind of in a, a preppy way. Um, I know she works at her uncle's garage sometimes. Well, I say work. She can't be bothered to work. I mean, all the, all the guy has to do is clean a windscreen and the other one wants to pay to pay. The, it's like it's the hardest thing in the world to do. She struggles with it. But, you know, it's it's just one of those things where you go, where's the appeal here? Because, yes, Michelle, Michelle Pfeiffer is a beautiful woman. She's been in many films. You know, she was brilliant as Catwoman. I thought, you know, uh, Frankie and Johnny was a great movie. You know, uh, Stardust. To be, you know, more recently, great, great appearances by Michelle Pfeiffer. This, however, I don't think was very well cast. I think it was an inappropriate role for her. There's some interesting choices. There's some interesting choices, but I, I had a problem from the get go. I had a problem with the first. Now, all the musical numbers for me, are inexplicably placed in with no connection to anything. They just kind of happen. They don't and drive the story along, do they? They're, they're, just, yeah. they're just coincidental. So that opening dance school routine that goes on for such a long time with, the, you know, everyone is doing crazy things. And then Michael gets off a bus and meets Frenchie and it, is such a do you know you are Sandy's cousin from England? Yeah. That is literally how he's introduced, and then yeah. never mentioned again. Yes, and and why is he English? Why why is her cousin English? What what is it? Just because they got an English actor, or they wanted to mix it up a bit, or they were looking at the British market to try and get? I just don't quite know why he wouldn't have been Australian, or why he couldn't have been American. It, I, I don't know whether that was just so that the cool rider character speaking with an American accent could be differentiated from Michael because he try he does do that, doesn't he? He does speak when he's wearing the goggles. Well, like in a sort of a pseudo American accent. He speeds a little bit deeper, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Michael played by the British actor, Max Caulfield. Um, yes. He's starring his first breakout film. Yeah. Um, and um you know, I think I think he's learned to act since that film, which is good. <laughs> well, he was a very pretty man, wasn't he? He was a very, very pretty dreamy. Man. Very, very, was, very dreamy. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I'm a full, a, a full blooded a heterosexual man, as as you mostly are, Mike. Um, and uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, he is he is a knee he's a knee uh, trembler that guy. He's so. a he's got this James Dean vibe, hasn't yes, he? Uh, very much about so. it. You know, blonde hair. And, you know, and this was something lips. that this was something that I didn't get, right? Because even when he was looking nerdy, he was an extremely good looking guy. And none of the girls paid any attention to him whatsoever. Um, but the the poison dwarf um J- Johnny seems to be like the flavor of the month for most of the girls. <laughs> it's That's because cool. he wears it's because he wears a jumper and glasses, okay? Yeah, well exactly. Yeah. But this was a handsome man, and you're like, surely they can see past the fact he's wearing a cardigan, you know. It's like what what why is that so different? And the other thing was when he eventually does become this cool rider that he's aiming to with. He's only wearing a pair of goggles. It's not like he's Batman. You can tell who people are. So, <laughs> um, I, and and he gets pretty close up to the, some of them, and it does take them a very long time to realise who he is. He goes on a date with Michelle Pfeiffer's character and doesn't take his helmet and glasses off once, and she accepts it, and she's like, "Hey, that's okay." Um, nice look, helmet. Just before I want to, I want to pick apart a couple of things at the beginning, right? Because okay. we are not going to break down every scene and stuff no, like no. that. But I had a problem with that arse wiggle up the school steps in the opening dance number. They're doing this kind of like backwards and forwards up the steps, but everyone's shaking their asses. I had a bit of a problem with that. I had a problem with the fact that um, the T birds are all smoking, and then lecture the pink ladies about how bad smoking is mm-hmm. and um the pink ladies pledge in the song is to act cool be cool and live cool till death do us part so that's that's a bit of a pledge there's a theme there with being cool they always keep saying we got to be cool and we want to be cool and touch their hairs but no one really is cool mm-hmm. but um the really the big thing that jumps out at me is 
Mr. Spears is having a full on shaking mental breakdown <laughs> and then drops down and we don't know is it did he die i mean i know he comes back later on but yeah. he <laughs> it's really horrible it's, to watch it's, it is uncomfortable isn't it and you know in this day of of um you know mental well-being um you know and us being a, very aware that we need to take care of our mental health he is a very much poked as a, a character of fun and played for laughs that this guy has been so traumatized by all these kids and all the goings on at this school that he is literally having fits and collapsing every time they wheel him out at the school. And then, and then he worse than that, Steve, the principal announces it over the tannoy system that he's back after his mental breakdown <laughs> and he's there shaking in his chair mm. uh, and then just drops down on his desk. It's like, it's good for you to be back at the school. They think it's a good idea. Nobody thinks it's a good idea. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> oh, dear. But, you know, and I don't know if it was um, if it was just me. Um, I didn't understand what the fascination with bowling was. Why was everybody at the bowling alley all the time? They they are branded bowling uh, shirts with yeah. T birds and pink ladies on it. They have they have their own bowling balls that all the girls all you know all have pink ones and and stuff. And um, I would be <laughs> stressed if I ran that bowling club with what they do, especially yeah. during the dance routine and everyone's running up and down the aisles and, well, and even the nuns are dancing. That was something I noticed that pretty much every single ball was a foul ball because everybody just stepped over the line every time. I was like. <laughs> Nobody's scoring any points tonight because this is this is just ridiculous play. And how not slippy the lanes were. Because if you go on a real bowling alley, if you've ever stepped over the line, it is super slippy on on a, a ten pin bowling lane. They, that's the point of it. There's very little friction, so the ball rolls beautifully. They were walking up and down and dancing, and and yeah, they were sliding around. But when they were stood still, they were stood like you know, this is fine, this is good. You go on there, it's like ice sometimes when you get on a bowling alley. You stand on below behind the uh, the lines. So just felt that it, it was somewhat disingenuous at that point. Well, that place was jam-packed full of professional, professional dance of New York dancers. Wow. There were so I many know. turns. There were so many circles and, and, and turns um, in montages with that one. There was one guy, he must have done about nine or ten turns in one go. I was very impressed. And what, later on in the movie, I noticed they did a, there was a, a dance sequence where they even sped it up and all the dancing was just like at triple speed and they were just making things go faster and faster. But it wasn't impressive. It just looked like everything was out of control and, and somebody you was sure on you cocaine. just went speeding the film up to end it? Quicker. No, in general, well, it, I, I think I would have liked that. But no, there was definitely a point <laughs> where they were, you know, they altered the speed of the, of the film in order to make it look like they were spinning faster and faster. I don't know if it was at the at the luau at the end with the song that was a a complete rip-off from the first movie. I don't know if you noticed that when it was like a luau, baloo, ba, baloo, ba, ba, do, ba, shoo, ba, do, ba, shoo, ba, do. Yeah, the, like, oh, the worst bit was when they're all in um they're all in a line, like they did in the original Greece where they're in a the line, they're doing that kind of dancing thing, but they're doing this like kind of up and down squatting thing. Um it, it made me feel a bit sick. It made me feel a bit sick. Um, look, I mean, the song in the bowling club is "We're going to score tonight," right? So it, there's a there's a double meaning to all of that. Is there? We really? know what the, the, there's not. We know what they're getting at, you know, because we know Johnny is really going to score tonight with the blonde girl, who is like she's up for it. She's mm. a pink lady. She's up for it, and then he immediately tries to crack on back to Michelle Pfeiffer again, and and Johnny just. Is the tone is the Tony Monero of Gre the Greece world? He's got no yes. redeeming quality to him. There is there is nothing. It's like why is anybody? Why are they chasing after him? Is it is it his looks? He's not particularly cool. I don't think not not in a sort of Danny way. Johnny is much more like you know, like I say, it was he was like the brunt of the litter. So he didn't he didn't have that. That smile, that charm, that way about himself that made people swoon. He just, they just seem to behave the same way, even though he doesn't display any of those attributes. I think you've touched on something quite important to remember here, right? There's a diatomy play. So if you remember Danny in Greece, who is the, the, the proto 
you know, version of the, the leader of the T-Birds. Even at the start of the film, they showed this sensitive version of him yeah. on the beach, you know, and yeah. he when was he's troubled, he was yeah, torn. he was. He was trying. He had this persona and stuff like that. With Johnny, he's just, he's just, uh, he's just a dick. And why do they? So it's in California somewhere, right? Supposedly, why do they yeah. all have Brooklyn? Hey, how you doing? Oh, hey, how you? why yeah. do they all like all of them sound like they're from New York? Yeah, there's this sort of East Coast West Coast bridge that some of the somehow they seem to be be you know it doesn't really matter where they are. It's kind of this imaginary place, and yeah, I mean, I, I I'm not 100 on the geography of where that was supposed to be set, but. Uh, even it, me and my limited uh, knowledge of the United States know how far apart California and, and the state of New York are as well. So hey, it's yeah, a it's very a long way, way, you know. Hey, it's hey, a very long hey. way. I'm from Rydell High, and I'm right one of the deep birds. Yeah, um, it was very strange. Um, it was. Now another thing that's strange. I don't know if you picked up on this, right? Dolores, the girl on the skateboard. Bearing in mind, skateboards didn't come out until like the late sixties, but we'll we'll look past that. Um, that style of skateboard she's riding, yeah, didn't come out. No. Um, Dolores is about ten, or at she least says she she's looked 14. about ten. She says she's, she's 14, fourteen, doesn't she? Yeah, right. Okay, she looked to me about ten, and it looks a bit weird. Because everyone is grown. I mean, like Michael obviously befriends her and stuff, yeah. and he's got he's got full on sideburns. So he's like he's, in his twenties. Well, this is funny, you know. You should mention that because my daughter actually came in the room while I was watching this and sat down and stopped watching. She's seen Greece. Uh, she's like she's eleven, nearly twelve, and she she sat down and she's watching. She went, all these people are middle aged, Dad. Why are they still at school? <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I genuinely don't know. I don't know. I also don't know why Shooter McGovern. Um, is is one of the T birds either? You know, there's a lot of things that weren't explained as to why these middle aged men um, were in this. I mean, I know in Greece one, okay, that uh, Rizzo, she the the actress uh, was was in was like thirty at that point and was playing a teenager. Yes, I get that, but she could get away with it. You know, there were younger members of the cast. There were some very young people in it, but. Everybody in this movie seemed to be about 10 years older than they were supposed <laughs> to be playing. Well, look um, at Eugene. Eugene, a returning character, for, a minor character from the first one. He was a senior, so why is he back at high school again? Being really weird. I, this, this is it. Why, did, why was he being slightly bullyish? Did you notice that? He kind of runs in and does something to antagonise <laughs> them. And you're like, no, <laughs> you don't. Why? Yeah, and like you say, if he was such a a geek such a nerd surely he's graduated was he a, a junior when the others were seniors I, I they don't seem to have thought through why he's there is he a teacher's aide is he some sort of student teacher now there, there is no explanation to it it is truly I, i've got no idea i i do know though that the faculty are just as pervy as the as the students especially with the talent contest and you had the blonde teacher um, that's flirting with all the boys all the time and stuff. And then she she turns to the, the the principal when she says they're my girls. And then she went, "Isn't that good breeding?" I I don't know if I've have you ever had that uh, you know at school with a good, like they've said to your kids, yeah, "Good breeding there, good breeding, Steve." Um, I, I, wasn't something that ever really came up, you know, unless we were talking about horses or something. So. Yeah, not really one that we, we considered massively, but, you know. I think um, they're referring to the twins. There's, there's the twins um, in yeah. there doing a dance number. Yeah, again, unexplicable characters in this in this movie that don't seem to drive the story along and are just there. there. Just <laughs> Everybody there. just appears to be there. It's a very weak story in comparison. Um, you know, it feels a little bit... This feels like a, they've gone tried to go for a rock musical rather than a rock and roll, and they didn't employ anybody that could actually sing. I think that was one of the key things for me is everybody, and I don't know if it's just the, the version that I was watching, you know, degradation over time. Everybody was out of key. Everybody was just awful, and I was like, "Is this really the best we can do?" You know, I mean, no, we, you know, we've not got Travolta and and, and Newton John, but. Even so, surely you could have mustered up somebody that can hold a tune long enough to to get through, you know. But it didn't just felt like it was. 
the the Motown classics, the Four Tops did some of the uh, did some of the singing in that film actually. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, they did. So look, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer's solo. Do we think it's her singing? Um, she's singing Cool Rider, one of the most famous songs that came out of the film. Um, it's now seen as a, a feminist classic. Um, I don't know whether she. I, I mean, you'd hope they did their own singing because you know there's plenty of people from musical theatre out there. Um, from Broadway, from the West End, that could do these kind of things, right? They could do it. They, they've they got the looks, they've got the charm, they've got the charisma, they've got the ability, they've got the talent, right? So why pick somebody that can't do that to be in the movie version? I don't know. It feels like I, I, they should be able to do it. I, I don't know either, but um, I do have a problem with the song Cool Ride. And I know people are going to listen to it and think we're just being nasty and horrible. Oh, I have a problem with it because, um, well, one, I mean, um, it's soft rock. It reminded me of a Susie Quattro song, which was 10 years before soft rock really, really came out and hit mainstream. And that, it, it just wasn't in keeping with 1961. I know, I know um, but you've got, to think, you've got to think of Quattro and you've got to think of Happy Days. And that was set in the 50s. So maybe there's kind of a, a tie in between that it was made in the 80s. It was set in the early over. 60s. And then there was a bit of a kind of a, um, you know, a, a touch to that because there, it was like you say, like a pro, it was like a proto thing. I can't even explain it, but no. Um, well, okay. I, well, then I will, I will stand by. Then my other problem was whoever did her choreography and made her do that dance routine mm-hmm. should be shot. <laughs> it was. It's probably one of the worst solo dance routines I've ever seen. I'm not Michelle Pfeiffer dancing, which is fine, but the moves and everything they had her doing was just, it just <laughs> seemed a bit bonkers to me. Um, I, I, and I, I remember just thinking, whoever choreographed that, seriously, they must have been scraping the barrel here. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't very sensual or sexy or, or anything, was it? But it wasn't even strong and aggressive. It was just kind of... I don't know. It was very bizarre. Uh, you did know. you take uh, Did you take biology at school, Steve? Did you take science biology as a, as one of the classes? I, I think it was part of the curriculum. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever? I mean, because I did too, and I do remember classes on, um, you know, flower, you know, flowers and uh, pollination. Yeah. And yeah. All that. Did you Do you remember that as well? I do remember the stamen. Yeah. And, Photosynthesis and the whole, you all, know, all that everything stuff, about yeah. all that shebang. Yeah. yeah, I don't remember ever digressing into sex, um, humanistic sex, during oh. a science lesson. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose at some point there is that sense of, at one level, reproduction happens right across the board, even with plants, and this is how they do it. But we do it in a much more fun way. Da, 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 and then we do a song about it. But yeah, well, it's just it was just let's find another way to be a bit seedy. It just felt like I don't know if that reproduction reproduction won't you give it to me now? Mm. Mm. Um, not at the moment, if that's okay, because we're we're, we're uh, that that's okay with the with the with the science teacher whose attempt taking over Mister Spears's class. Yeah, um, creepily cleaning his glasses while they all sing with this kind of amused, creepy look smile on his face while the blonde pervy teacher sits in a corner just watching on yeah. um he got very very steamy very very but it was the th- over theatrical way the, t- the all the students are like oh we're bored and we're pretending to sleep and then he says something and they all shoot up and then they all kind of lean forward in unison and stuff like that and i'm just like oh god <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was there there was a complete lack of innocence i found in this movie there was no there was none of the charm and the will they won't they and the it never felt like there was there was nothing to keep going, ooh, ooh, what's going to happen next? I think you knew right from the beginning what was going to happen. And and it was giving away giving away very easily who, who the cool rider was. There was no kind of surprise to it. And But there were some terrible gags as well, Steve. I don't know if you picked up on this, right? So the principal is in the corridor and the school bell's going in this young girl walks up to her and she says, you know, whatever her name is, Mrs. I can't remember, Mrs. Principal. Um, I'm really, really concerned. I'm really worried. And she says, why dear, what's wrong? And she went, I've missed my last two periods. And she went, Oh, that's okay. You can catch up. And off she go. And the girl walks off with this like kind of look on her face. And I was just like, WTF, what, what, 
<laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's like that. She thinks that she's talking about her lessons. And and it's, we, yeah, it's like, I, I see what you're doing, but that's really not very funny. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe it wasn't the time. Maybe they're like, I've got this yeah. great gag, right? Yeah. This great, yeah. go, go up and say this and stuff. Yeah. Um, and then there's weird time jumps in the film as well, like really, because it would explain why they change costumes constantly. Mm. Um, Beast one, Michael deciding that he's going to be a T-bird and Frenchie, the ghost, the ghost of Frenchie encourages <laughs> him along. And he builds a full-on motorcycle in 22 seconds. Yeah, well, he, he, the, the, he's, he's doing everybody's homework for them, isn't he? We, f- we forget about that. All the T-birds are coming to him secretly going, um, can uh, Hey, can Shakespeare, do hey, yeah. do my homework, hey, Shakespeare. Hey, what, why has everybody got a nuclear shelter? I mean, it was 1961, but they weren't that far into the Cold War. And everybody's like, everybody's got a shelter. What, you know, Michael's li- essentially living in one at his uncle's house or something. <laughs> You're like, what? But, Wait, what? But, What's going on? Did you notice one, when when they first go into the shelter, it's above ground. When they, the next time they go into the shelter to do the pervy um, song is, about... I don't think that's the same shelter. I think that's a different shelter. It's a different shelter. Yeah, because that's what I'm, that's, that was my point, was that everybody seemed to have these nuclear bunker shelter things. And it was like, is this really a thing? I mean, I, I know we did drills for um, like Cold War um, bomb drills at my school. We had some, we had a siren on the roof and they would test it occasionally. We'd have to do things where we'd go and, you know, stand in the playground and, and wave at the bomb as it landed on us. You know, that was basically, <laughs> you know, there's no escaping it. So you may as well just go out and have some fresh air for five minutes before it happens. Um I remember that, but I don't remember as built, nobody was building bunkers in back gardens. I don't know. Was that a thing where you grew up or? Um, no, no um, because I grew up on a really dodgy council estate that's not worth bombing at the time. So we were safe. <laughs> it, it just, it, it sparked no interest. <laughs> <laughs> they flew over and went, oh, we've already been here. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, that's already been done. That's already been done. Just leave it. <laughs> we were, they, they, dropped a, they dropped a bomb and it did pounds worth of damage. <laughs> um it's there's there's other things as well like when michael is playing can michael plays a piano as well but he's so obviously not playing it his arms are just moving up and down he's just like kind of flapping he looks like he's knocking one out actually at times really well i don't know how you do that but uh that's definitely not my <laughs> technique um <laughs> so yeah so i mean when we when we think about the romance side of it again there is no kind of real great romance as there in this is um, Michelle Pfeiffer's character just wants to get ploughed by the um, by the by the, cool by the meanest cool rider because she even says, "I want him to, you know, I want them to give it to me hard and and all this." It's not she wants to ride a cool devil or something. Yeah, she and, says. yeah, ride it all night long and all this. And it's like there's no romance involved. There's no, you know, it's just kind of uh, oh, I just want you know. At least in the first one, you had that sense of um, I want you know we. Sandy wanted the romance, but Danny was a bit cool and wanted to get laid. And then they found this happy medium and that it was, you know, the romance could come through and they could keep this persona. This just felt like, well, he yeah. Does, he's, 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 his chat isn't very good, right? Because yeah. he, she says at one point, I'm shivering. And he says, are you cold? And she went, no, I'm not cold, right? Mm. But then she says something to him. And then he says the word incestuous back to her. And she's really impressed, but it seems to really get her going. And it's <laughs> seriously, that Ooh. really happened. I wrote it yeah. down. And I was like, and he was like, oh, and he went incestuous. And she's like, oh, that's a nice <laughs> word. I like that word. And it's like, <laughs> okay, yeah, you do know the entomology do. of that. You do know what that means, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't feel the same if you knew what the word was about. <laughs> a game for all the family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. That's a, that'd be the board game, wouldn't it? Um, <laughs> so yeah and I just I don't know it just seemed to miss the beat this movie it was kind of off the beat it was that the routines were overly choreographed they were you know instead of being fun they would they were trying too hard to tr- to harness something that the first film had that this film definitely didn't the story wasn't strong enough there wasn't there was no real likable characters. I mean, Michael, yes, you felt a little bit of a, a like affinity for, I guess, as the protagonist, but 
No, I didn't. I didn't find anybody in the movie that I particularly liked. They were. Really... I found Michael really douchey, to be yeah. honest with you. One dimensional. He what his sole purpose is to. All right, he's you know he's fallen in love with Stephanie and. He can't get to her because he's not a T-bird. The only mm. way he can get into a T-bird is to build a motorcycle, then get good at riding a motorcycle, and then randomly turn up on his motorcycle to in which the T-birds and the Crater Face gang randomly then chase him for no reason, um, just because they there's nothing better to do. Mm. Um, and and he gets the girl, and that's it. You don't learn anything really about him at all, or even why yeah. he's there. No. It's, there's there's no motivation for it, is there? It just just happens. Um, there's a few other things to to consider then, and I don't know whether you've got any things that you've thought about over the 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 course of the time since you since you watched this and when you reflect on it. Why did he then want to be a T bird? Because so let's put it this way: um, Michelle Fife, Stephanie, right? Michelle Pfeiffer's character, Stephanie, she's not that fussed about being a pink lady. I don't think she's that bothered. She just hangs out with the girls that are. She barely even wears the the the, the pink lady the coat. Why at the end is he so gleeful that he's got the T birds jacket and they're so happy that he's now a T bird? Why is that instrumental in them having a relationship? Because he won Johnny's respect in like. 20 not even three seconds yeah but i don't get who wants johnny's respect johnny's a douche nobody likes <laughs> johnny, johnny johnny's a wimp who when they come out of the um when they come out of the bowling alley because they think that crater face is on his own right out the side the front and then all his mates are there and they just go oh at him and, l- and lunge at him he runs inside and hides as do the rest of the t-birds and you go why did you do that why, why did you make them so wimpy and so uncool and then try to make the payoff for the guy who, um, you know, as, as you know, had this transformation be that he gets to hang out with them now? Well, I, I, I think that they moved the formula, formula around as much as they could, because if the, the pink ladies are more empowered mm. than the guys, I mean, even the blonde girl whose name I can't remember. She, he, Johnny, I don't know if you remember in the talent contest, she's wearing, you know, very skimpy top. And he goes absolutely mental at her and starts throwing costumes on her and saying, no, you cover up. You are not, he's really, Johnny's really controlling. And, and yeah. she says, no, I'm not having this. You're not telling me how to dress. You're not yeah. telling me what to do anymore. I'm sick of this. I'm putting my foot down. And Michelle Pfeiffer did the same thing to Johnny earlier in the film. There is a theme with this guy, yeah. this guy. Is not going to be a good husband. No, he's he's a sexual predator, and but then he's overly possessive and protective, and 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 he's you know it won't, won't let people express themselves. Um, the talent contest was another thing for me. Why were they all taking? But why was everyone so keen to be in this talent contest? You know, the guys to win the admit, records to win the records. I, I, but this is what it, you know. Everybody could afford these amazing bowling shirts that would have cost quite a lot to get embroidered. They can, you know, everybody's got a motorcycle or something, and and you know, then nobody's poor in this, and then they're trying to win some record tokens. What they're what? winning future records because the records that they were going to win hadn't come out yet. That's another fact I learned. Um, they were like <laughs> from like 1964 and 65. Um, I I don't know what the motivation was, and there is a good group in it. There's that kind of a cappella group, three guys mm. really good at singing for no reason whatsoever. Uh, Johnny and the T Birds tie them up, turn the water on, and leave them in the shower. Yeah, and then they're bullies, aren't spot. they? They're not nice yeah. people when they're doing this. You know, I wondered if they'd get them. You know, what I thought would have been good was if they'd have got them, they bullied them into doing the singing backstage and they would mime and then they get caught out doing it or something. There would at least been a little bit of a, <laughs> something. Been a little comedy something. or something there, but it just felt like bullying for bullying's sake. And Steve, what was the guy in the green suit doing? Well, the weird kind of rock and roll guy. What was he was doing? Grabbing people. <laughs> and shaking, shaking like, re- no, really, like, honestly, he was like doing this kind of, I don't want to say the word spazzy, but he was doing this horrible kind of, I he can't like explain it. He was it. having a stroke or something. There was definitely something not right there. It was bizarre. And then he's grabbing the legs of people as yeah, well, so they yeah. can't. He'd lost all control, didn't he? He just seemed to be <laughs> so in in with his music that 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 and i think this was the whole point of this movie in terms of 
it just was just missed the beat for me on on so many occasions. There was there was great potential to have a story there. I could see what they were trying to do with the mysterious stranger, and you know, it's and 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 this dual personality and this don't judge a book by its cover because underneath it there's a sensitive guy. Blah blah blah. I get all of that, and I get where they were trying to go, but I just can't help but think there was what was it that was missing from this that that it didn't have any charm. It was no I have one charm. confession. I do have Go one confession it. to make. I, I, I feel um, to be balanced, I need to say this. The song that the girls do in the talent contest, A Girl for All Seasons, yeah. I actually really like that song. <laughs> I actually thought it was the best song in it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually and did like I, I Sorry, I couldn't do that. Um, and, but, the, and the ballet steps, um, they were on point. They literally, at one point, were walking on their toes in ballet shoes. That That's impressive that, you know if yeah but ever I, trying I, to do that it is extremely difficult without doubt the only song that didn't make me want to fast forward it and out of respect for the podcast and respect for you steve i i watched every single bit of it and, and carried on <laughs> through um just because i didn't want to be that cheater um mm-hmm. i actually enjoyed that bit i actually enjoyed that song yeah. well you we'd attempted to watch it several times before and for some reason in the rehearsals, they never complete the song, do they? Because somebody's always late or, or something. Always happens. there. But he, Michelle Pfeiffer's character, Stephanie, she goes into this fantasy while she's on stage. And I've got to say, um, that's where we see Michael. He's like kind of in this silver suit. He looks like a cross with his helmet and his glasses. He looks like a cross of the T-1000 from Terminator 2 and George <laughs> Michael. <laughs> yeah. It's like, <laughs> Doesn't uh, it? I am the gay Terminator like that, but no, the, the 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 second one in Terminator Two, you know the one. Yeah, the no, I, one, I I yeah. I know that. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, it just was kind of like a a weird, yeah, like glitter. Yeah, glitter it looks effect. like him and and one of George Michael's songs. Um, go out just combined together. Yeah. That's all I could see when I saw that, and I was like, okay, that's, public that's, lose that's... when the glitter balls come up. And, yeah, I know <laughs> yeah. what you mean. Yeah, it's, and, it's uh, genuinely bizarre, isn't it? <laughs> it really is. And then and then suddenly it goes from there to a Lowell. And then the, the Luel, it starts Luel. during the day. The Luel, yeah, yeah, yeah. It starts during the day, and they dance and sing, and then it's suddenly night. Are they? Is that whole song the whole day? Well, I think it's probably that it happens in the afternoon, and turns into the evening. You know, as I mean, I know you live in Scotland, where it is pretty much either dark or light for the whole day, depending on the time of year. But it does actually get dark here. At, you know, between about five and six, it can go from daylight to dark in that period of time of, of an hour. So okay, I can kind well, of get where that might happen. That's explained. That, that, that's explained. <laughs> what, what, what isn't explained is why Mr. Spears is back again and without hesitating walks straight into the pool and just starts like kind of thrusting in the water, under the water. Uh, yeah, I, I was uncomfortable with that. <laughs> why they, why they, this is the guy who's so nervous he's having fits. Let's bring him back at the big party with the drums and the fireworks. That'll be a good idea. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> loud noises oh, yeah um, it, yeah um he's very and then, brick isn't he why do the right why did crater face turn up again oh why yeah, did they, they turn up there and, and why is nobody calling the police right this gang of middle-aged bikers keeps terrorizing the school <laughs> and yet the teachers do nothing about it there's no police involved no nothing they just behave however they want to behave it, it, it it's perplexing it really is and you know i mean we're we're probably getting towards time now so we, we're probably going to have to wrap up a little bit but... we, we, we will wrap up on these couple of points so yeah. um helmet hair is non-existent because he yeah. takes his helmet off when he revealed it was the shittiest reveal ever <laughs> he just takes his glass off and everyone's like oh and then she's like oh i thought it was you and yeah. then that kiss i don't know if you heard it but it was like it was really <laughs> yeah. wet and horrible and i was like oh please stop like, <laughs> i think i think the term sound out and, you know, uh, and then the running and slips, um in my own was having a thing about musicals we love musicals right we love musical theater um we we've been we've been in and around performing arts all our lives and stuff so you know this is something that we we could have loved but it just missed the mark at every attempt. So I think that's the scale of things on this is I don't want people thinking we're anti-musicals. We love musicals. We love some of the shows that are out there. 
your uncle musical instead. <laughs> yeah, we're not anti musical. <laughs> we're all just no. I mean, musical. yeah. I mean, look. At the end of the day, right? Let's remember what we're doing here, and it can't. You know, if we cover Greece, Greece isn't a bad script. Greece is a classic film. Um, Greece too, not so much. Has a cult following. Mm. Very, very big. Um, it sends a, a very strong message out on on female empowerment, which we are fully behind and we fully yep. love. And I think it, I think that was that that was the main that gave it an extra star for me to go. Do you know what? Actually, I get that bit and I liked all of that. It was yeah. just everything else around it that was crap. <laughs> yeah, and that, I think that's the term, isn't it? It was the it was the sort of bargain supermarket version. If Greece was the Waitrose, this was this very much felt like the Heron. Um, or the um, or the netto of uh, of stores, <laughs> you know. This is your Seven Eleven stuff that uh, the Ameri- uh, our American listeners might think. You know, if, if you were thinking of like your your high end shops versus your low end, this is definitely like the. the anyway, I'm not going to try and do that now. But uh, listen, we're going to do our ratings as we always do at the end of these things. So, Mike, I'm going to ask you to give me a number of motorcycles out of five that you rank Greece to. Well, I'd be ranking these in a British classic motorcycle, the Triumph, and I will give this drum roll, please. I will give this. E. I'm gonna give this uh, two motorcycles. Ooh, that's a two motorcycles, which I don't think is bad. I think mean, that's that's quite generous. Oh, yeah, I, I I gave an extra star because of Michelle Pfeiffer and the yeah. message she was conveying with the pink ladies. I think that's right. I think you know what, for nostalgia purposes and the fact that it has a cult following. I'm going to give it two motorcycles as well because, you know, uh, I agree with you and I agree with your points and I managed to sit through it in one sitting, which, you know, not all of the movies we've covered in this podcast I've been able to do without having a break and wiping my forehead down. But um, but it really, really, really suffered from the fact that its predecessor was was so good Um it, it, it just kind of pointed out how not good this was. Well, um, Steve, as a side note, this is the first film we've reviewed that we've agreed the rating together. Oh, look at that. There we go. In unison. <laughs> right. OK, well, listen, thank you, everybody, so much for listening. Stay tuned. We've got some really exciting news coming up soon about The Last Resort and the script that we've written um that we're going to be uh there may be some new episodes coming so stay tuned in the next in the coming weeks we will give you more information about what's going to happen there but in the meantime um if you want to follow us on twitter we're at scripts bad we're on instagram at bad scripts we've got our own facebook page we've got the website you can catch any of the links that you need to for our show on linktree forward slash bad scripts so check it all out. Um, are there any shout outs that you'd like to do today, Mike? Anybody out there you want to give a, a heads up to? Just to say thank you for sticking with us and continuing to listen to us. Thank you. Brilliant. And as always, I like to give you the final words for the week on the show. Um, thank you for joining us. Make sure you come back next time for another episode of the Bad Scripts uh, Last Resort Movie Club. But for now, goodbye from me and from Mike. Incestuous. Bad Scripts was written and performed by Mike Garlier and Steve Jones. A Beach Tide production.